thank you for joining us here at the Freeman Gallery at Albright College in the Center for the Arts. I'm David Tanner, I'm the director for the Center for the Arts. And joining me shortly, we will have our artist, um, Erica Houston, uh, who will be um, coming down. She just finished up her artist lecture. Uh, she'll be joined by our new curator, uh, Honor Wilkinson, who started with us on October 1st. And we're gonna be going through uh, the exhibition, Contemporary Weavings by Erica Houston. So uh, I'm gonna give you a little sneak preview while we're waiting for them uh, to come down. Let me flip my camera around so you can see what I see. And here is the entryway into our project space gallery. So you can kind of see as we come up this uh, quarantine piece that we just learned a lot about in Erica's lecture. We're seeing one edge of it. There's the title for the show. Always fun to see your name on the wall, right? And here is quarantine. Blind you with that light. So you can see it kind of wrapping around the wall here. Coming down to the edge and then also wrapping again around the corner. And we just heard a lot in Erica's lecture about what she calls um, the drippings kind of coming down, hanging down off of this. So I wanna give you guys a close up visual here of all of that. And you can also see if I can get close enough here, how this piece is put together. And this is an unusual piece for her as we heard her say uh, in the lecture, uh, she typically loves color and, and works with multiple colors in her palette. Uh, or multiple use within a color palette. Um, but for this particular piece, kind of working during the pandemic um, with materials that were available to her, uh, she created this very kind of solemn piece called Quarantine. And um, in through this it really took some time to kind of explore this idea of weavings not necessarily having to be contained to a flat space and being able to wrap around things. And so for this iteration, we actually created this wall for her um, to be able to use to illustrate that concept. Very cool. Back to the title. I know tonight, if you're just joining us um, for this virtual tour of Erica Houston's uh, Contemporary Weaving Show, we're gonna have some guests that will be coming in. Um, I think her parents are already here in the gallery, so we'll see them very, very shortly. Uh, Erica herself will be joining us along with curator Honor Wilkinson there, just coming down from uh, that virtual artist lecture that just happened a little earlier. I hope you guys all enjoyed that, got to participate. We'll get some big views here of the show as well. And then we'll also go into some close-ups as we go through. I know um, our curator is gonna ask her some specific questions about individual pieces and things like that. One of the other pieces that we talked about and spent some time um, in the artist lecture talking about was this piece. Um, so uh, Quarantine, which we just saw, and this piece called Fake News are the two that really um, were created specifically for this installation. And Erica talks about this piece being uh, kind of double-sided here, so you can see the other side. Get a close-up of this so that you can really see the newspapers in this that she's woven in. Hopefully you guys can all hear me. I just realized my sound was down. And then here in the center part of this, you can um, see the reference that she had mentioned with our current uh, President Trump and that 
kind of orange strip coming down made out of plastic bags and other fibrous materials. And then really, if I, as I back up, you get that sense of scale. Um, so this is one of her, uh, this is her longest piece, I think she said, in one of her largest pieces that she's attempted. Uh, and we're very, very excited to see it here in the gallery. Hello, everyone. Thank you guys for joining us. Hi, Ralia. <laughs> Yeah, it is really cool to see that use of newspaper in this one uh, since it is dealing with fake news. So cool. Michaela's joined us, Karen. Nice to see all you lovely people. So one of my favorite pieces is this little piece here. I love this kind of... Um, organic shape that she has and you see this reflected in another piece um, here on the other side of it that I'll show you in a second um, but I really am always drawn to the kind of oranges and salmon colors uh, and uh, so this is one of my favorite little pieces here really nice this is actually not a, a little piece this is kind of a medium-sized piece I would say and then the other work in the show that kind of references that same kind of organic feel in the weaving itself is this piece here um, called Color Splash Number Two. Really beautiful. And again, beautiful colors, really illustrating the artist's focus and intent with color theory here. Here's another piece that does that quite well as well, all in very neutrals, kind of going out from the edges where it's almost black, dark brown, and then coming in to the central beige that you see in the center. Quite a lovely piece too. I should also remind folks these um, works are all um, well, almost all for sale, not all of them. There are a few that are not. Um, and um, these would make great gifts for our coming holiday season as well. I think, in fact, this little wall here, most of these pieces are right around the range of a $40 price tag, if I remember correctly, and quite lovely. So a great gift. And weaving has really kind of taken a resurgence. I have uh, seen some uh, things kind of referencing weaving and a resurgence of that on Etsy and even in stores like Target and West Elm, things like that, all different price points. Um, but these are lovely little things that could be acquired um, quite easily. And I'm sure Erica would love to have a piece sold from the show. She has lots of colors to choose from here as well. So I'm sure you can find your favorite, whether it's purple or green. And she uses really different um, materials and textures in all of this. So if we look at this one and then compare it to the purple here, really interesting kind of fuzzy textures and more slim yarn and things like that interwoven. Yeah, really beautiful. I don't think I showed you this one yet. Here we've got some variegated yarns. And I also like that she's mixed up her kind of um, uh, hanging rods as well. Welcome, Jafit, Sandy, welcome everyone. you like neon green, this might be the piece for you. So these reflect some of her more simple, smaller scale pieces, but again, a range, like here you can see um, uh, this kind of uh, hanging device with the threaded rod. Here we have a rod that has a more rustic, natural feel to it. Uh, and then we have also some that are smooth. 
both metal and wood, all different kinds of things. All right, so those are some of her smaller works. Let's take a look again at some of these larger pieces. And I'm gonna turn this over here uh, for that to honor our uh, curator, uh, as well as Erica who have joined us down here. And they're gonna continue with their discussion. Hi. Hello. So let me switch this over. So here we go. Here's Hello, Honor. Hello, everyone. <laughs> nice thank, to see you through Facebook. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for joining us. Um, as I mentioned, I kind of introduced you here before. I'm going to turn this over to you. Um, you can flip it around whenever okay. you're ready. We've been just kind of taking a little tour, looking at things. Great. Um, both, you know, kind of panned out as well as close up. Great. But I know you have some more questions. I know one question, too, that I wanted to ask yeah. um, of our artist. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, you can kind of get this answer in when, when you guys get sure. here. But one question I had is, what's your favorite color? Mm. Oh, we didn't really ask that question. Yeah, that's a great question, that, right? yeah. Um, cerulean blue. Cer like cerulean blue. Color. Okay. Cerulean blue. Awesome. Interesting. So cerulean blue was that, if you didn't hear that. Yes. You might have to speak up, especially with our masks. Yes. And we just have the, the yes. phone mic. Um, but so, so is there... I was going to say, is there really, like, what would be the closest? Like, one of, one of these? Um, like this color, maybe? Is that cerulean? Close? Probably somewhere, like, in between that teal and the bridge blue. Okay. Usually, it's like this color on the top socket. <laughs> oh, nice. So between this color here, which is hard to see over Facebook, the, it is, yeah. the color. There's a famous line in uh, the Devil Wears Prada about cerulean blue. Yeah. <laughs> there is, in fact, yes. What is the line? It's something about, she's like schooling her young intern about, you know, fashion in general and the importance of it. Uh, and and she's kind of going off on her for not knowing like that the color is really in blue and okay. um, you know yeah it's it's a it's it's a very telling moment in the story so anyway all right I'm gonna leave you guys to it sure I know but this is amazing we spent some yes yeah, so we spent some time right you like this like I wore this specifically so I could match <laughs> it's perfect. Yeah, we spent some time looking at this piece, and we really um, got up close and looked at um, the newspapers that you've woven into this. Really interesting. Uh, and of course, I love the reference. Orange is my favorite color anyway. Uh, but I love the reference to, to Trump here and the, the big news and, and things like that. And the scale of it you were talking about earlier is so really important. Um, yeah. It's kind of your largest work to date. Um, and really inspiring you too. And the 360 nature. That's right, yeah. yeah. You took a little tour around it as well. Yeah, yeah. You can see yeah. yeah. that yeah. too. Yeah. Yep. So I'm going to get out too because your mom and dad want to come in. They're here today, right? <laughs> She's like, no, no, we don't want to come in. Well, we're so glad that you joined us though. We're glad to be here. Oh, so nice. Yeah, we're super, super happy to focus on um, Erica's artistic work here. So thank you. And I am very grateful. Yeah. yeah, we are we are grateful that you accepted the invitation. Yes, yeah, so uh, we have a viewer here saying that he loves the larger pieces oh, thank here. You. Okay. Um, and so these two lar largest ones here, this fake news, which we're looking at now, and the quarantine one, that black one you see across the gallery, those are your most recent oh, works. Pieces, yeah. And um, I know a number of people here on Facebook Live weren't a part of the Zoom. So, if you could talk a little bit about those two pieces, um, yeah. Um, so we can start with this one, I guess. So, make sure you guys can hear me. Yeah, I'm gonna get close um, to her. So, quarantine. I made that piece while we were in lockdown. I think that's kind of pretty obvious. And I was. Oh, I time <laughs> um, all the stores were shut down, so it was like I had never really purchased online. That was something we didn't talk about. So it was like I couldn't get to the stores to get materials. So I was like, how do I make pieces for this show with what I already have in my stash? Um, 
And then I kind of just started thinking a little bit more conceptually, which I don't usually do. I was like, how do I kind of make this tie into what's going on and like the time that this was created? And I luckily, like the largest stash I have is these just random blocks. Um, and I was like, that's really fitting, you know, like a lot of people are really struggling right now. Um, so let's just make it solid and let's just use all of these blocks that I'll I have. Over here. Um, and I wanted it to kind of represent the pits and valleys and the highs and lows people were facing during this time. So I incorporated a lot more of these ups and downs. And during the artist lecture, somebody actually had a really good point, and this wasn't intentional, but oh, yeah. um, that the negative space kind of represents like the, the graph of cases. Is that how they said that? Yeah, an infection graph. Like the infection they... graph, and that was like a really cool added element that I hadn't even intentionally landed on. Yeah, I found that question in the um, artist talk very interesting too, because when I look at Erica's work, I off, I see a gravity as being like a medium that you're using that none of these would look. I mean, you're making compositional choices knowing that gravity is going to affect them. And so I always see her works, especially um, this one, as as falling down, and, mm -hmm. and she described it as dripping. Um, and so I thought it was really interesting that the the student or viewer was seeing it as growing or in the opposite direction, looking at the negative space. Mm -hmm. And I think that the installation in here, um, where the lights are casting shadows, even, you know, yeah, make the wall part of the work as well, as well as um, the idea that Erica's works, um, like this quarantine, and the one I'll show you in just a moment, wrap around the walls and use the space's architecture, but also really accentuate it. Yes. So where they're hanging. So this one, quarantine. And as we travel along the wall here, you'll see one called Indigo Corner, which is one of, which one I really, really like because I think in addition to being architectural and, and structured that it shows, it really is a great representation of how you view color. Um, and, you've talked a lot about color gradients, but mm -hmm. this I see you using color as a way to create volume and depth in, in artworks that can be displayed in a two-dimensional way. So this one I see the color choices you've made really accentuates the yeah, idea of corner. That, like richer color for that space that's really far away. Exactly, it, like, yeah. It really pulls it back. Yeah, it plays with your understanding of space just through the use of color. Um, and you can see that here in this big red where you're using a similar gradient pattern, but that creates a sense of, of depth and volume. So with the idea of gradient, you'll see it, we'll see a lot of gradients going around in the exhibition. Can you talk a little bit about your use of color? Um, and I know you say color is kind of an inspiring uh, feature of your work and what you choose to make. So what draws you to color and how you choose the combinations um, or if it's more of a feeling? It's definitely more of a feeling. Um, outside of like quarantine, which kind of had a play, and like this one that kind of had a play into context, mm -hmm. um, I never really put too much thought into the color so much as just, um, I described this in the artist lecture a little bit, like the process of making has always been like a really important part for me. It's like my escape. So what colors are making me feel happiest or like pulled away from all the stresses of the world? What am I being drawn to? And then I just like take that and I run with it. Um, so it doesn't usually tie into like an emotional context or, or anything like, like that. It's much more just a feel, feel A feeling, yeah. yeah, which is which artists are very good at of choosing colors based on, you know, what you're feeling. These um, two works too. Um, yeah, in conversation with Erica during the installation, you kind of grouped the works we're seeing in the gallery into collections or, or kind of phases, yeah. chapters in, in your, your career so far. And you mentioned one being color blocks and color splashes. So if you could just talk a little bit about that. This one we're looking at here is one from the Color Block series. Color block series. Yeah. So I started out with the, the like smoother color gradients. Um, and those always kind of referenced in my mind like a painterly effect. 
Mm. Um, so I actually went from the color gradients to the color splash first. That was my first jump. Um, and kind of looking at how those colors would drip down if they were painted onto a canvas. And then um, I kind of wanted to step back from the gradients a little bit and just kind of experiment with what I call these color blocks where there's sections of color. Um, where I could pick those couple colors in particular that I was feeling drawn to, and rather than worrying about trying to find like a smooth gradation between them, how can I make a composition that works with just like these chunks of colors? Um, so I began with stripes, um, which you'll see in like these samples over here, before I jumped to making that piece you were just looking at um, that had like chunks of color. Um, so that's a relatively new style for me. Not sure where it'll go from here. We'll see. It ended up being used in fake news. Right, so you see here, these are the striped ones she was talking about that came first in your series or your exploration of this color blocking technique. Um, and then as she said, she moved on to this color blocking piece where you can see the colors aren't arranged in a gradient pattern but in kind of organic um, organic form. forms, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And then as she noted, the fake news here, she's also using that, that technique. That was like the culmination, that, the, the kind of thought process for fake news was one of the driving factors in some of those samples of trying to figure out a way to do a stripe as well mm -hmm. and not have it be just a gradient. Mm -hmm. um, so like those two, the two smaller samples were actually the original samples for fake news. I was going to have the orange along the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, but once I decided to go with the double-sided effect, I was like, I really want there to be a distinction between the sides. Um, how do I pull that away from being like fully wrapped around the bottom so that the back can be solid? Right. And that's when I started to transition to like this vertical mainstream idea and incorporate that in. Right. Fantastic. And looking at these two um, fake news here and this color blocking example here, those are the only two that I've noticed in the exhibition that have um, an uneven top line. has like oh, a, have a yes. more jagged edge and that's intentional. Some of her others have the, the straight edge. And I was just wondering how you um, came to the, you know, idea that these two would be working with an uneven top edge. So that actually, the, um, the color block sample on the wall, that was the first time that I played around with that idea of an uneven top edge. Um, and it was just, again, trying to play with form and push my form a little bit further. I've made a handful that have that straight top. Um, and then going more towards that organic, like you said, with that, the, the organic blocking of color instead, and further pushing that once I go to other architectural places, mm -hmm. how can I play with that architecture even more and push the form further? Mm -hmm. um, so that was just like the first experiment um, with using that unevenness, and then I pushed it really far when I got yes. to, to this one to kind of see, you know, how far can I yeah and i think this yeah in addition to the line being a bit more irregular i think it even stands out more because this one is free hanging in the space so you really your eye gets drawn to that top top mm -hmm. edge and it breaks up a lot of that like very structured line like because this does have that strong strong vertical in there i didn't yeah. want it to be so much like a perfect like square yes or rectangle definitely and you refer to these on a number of things as tapestries and so I was wondering, like a traditional definition of tapestry is very two-dimensional and often pictorial rather mm -hmm. than abstract. And so what drew you to the idea of making these not so much flat, but being really sensory and having these dangling, almost like tassels coming from your, your tapestry? I think, honestly, that was originally a mistake. <laughs> um, when I learned about tapestry techniques, it was introduced to me as tapestry and rug weaving. Okay. And I learned what's called the Ryan knot, mm -hmm. which is this pile weave where it has all these strings and it's a rug weaving technique. So if you have uh. a carpet, it's usually, it, if it's handmade for sure, mm -hmm. it uses that knot and then it's cut down really short and you just get uh. like a fluffy tuft, tufted rug kind of thing. 
Okay. Um, and I think in my mind, it was just all tapestry at that point in time. Mm -hmm. It was a tapestry technique. So I just like ran with it. And I think I just like, never stopped using that language. Um, and I just took that technique and I just, instead of cutting it down and making it fuzzy, I just let it hang. Let it yeah. Make really long piles and yeah. Which I think is really, um, really engaging for the viewer, but it gives you a very specific um, style and perspective as well. And the I like that you use the term tapestry because it challenges, you know, um, well, conventional. It does, and I still think tapestry has kind of multiple, multiple meanings anyway. Because a lot of people go tapestry and think of like those dyed panels mm -hmm. that you can buy and hang on. Right. And it's it's almost just a textile something that's molded for can kind of be thought of as a tapestry too. Um, yeah. So yeah, kind of pushes that boundary a little bit. Exactly. And I, I mean, one of my interpretations of your work <laughs> is the pushing kind of the boundaries of tradition, tra traditional materials and mm -hmm. and processes. And um, and I'm thinking specifically about these kind of color splash ones where you're, where um, you've described them as kind of mimicking or at least being an exploration of the way that paint um, is applied to a canvas and mm -hmm. falls down um, a canvas and that idea of using textiles or fiber or the process of weaving to kind of replicate a different material mm -hmm. is really, really interesting to me and something that I see as a kind of, a, trend throughout your work it definitely really is paint and like dye and like the dilution of dye to get those um the color gradients that are within the same color family instead of you know like ink or um the indigo goes from the golds to the indigo but i have a lot that just go from like a a, a pale color to a more saturated color and those to me are very indicative of like a diluted dye um or like an ombre dye even, I guess, would be a term people would. Yes, would yeah, really ombre, pick up yep. On. Now what is the, um, what are some of the challenges you face? Because I can imagine using a solid uh, material like textile to represent something that is liquid or has some viscosity would be challenging. So how, <laughs> what are some of the challenges you faced? Um, especially on these, you can kind of, if I point them out, probably pick up on, Tapestry is very, or weaving in general, is generally very structured. Mm -hmm. You have your warp and your weft. Mm -hmm. They run at perpendicular lines, and mm -hmm. it's usually very ordered. And if you look at, um, like, hand-woven fabrics, you will very easily see that. So when you try to then incorporate curved lines yes. into that, yes. you run into some areas that you kind of got to improvise and um, either... In some places, it's really easy to kind of create like a staggering that's smooth, but when you get to areas that are really sharp mm -hmm. and you only have like two work lines, it's like you kind of end up with like a gaping hole mm. and you have to be careful to weave in such a way that you have enough room to kind of go back in and connect those right. from behind. So um, within the Color Splash series in particular, there's a lot of work after it's off off the loom okay to secure all of those places to make sure that it holds as one piece mm -hmm. um and then also just like blending of color you're dealing with like you said you have you know let's just say four distinct colors you're not going to be able to blend those together like pigments and paint you just have to try and visually get them in such a layout that our human eyes perceive that as a flow of color that's seamless right um and that can be really tricky yeah looking at this piece earlier today i was just blown away with how smooth of a look curve that you were able to get because uh having a, a you know some understanding of the weaving process i know that that is that is really difficult mm -hmm. Um, so another um, work that's in this color splash series is this one, which I know David um, spent some time um, discussing today, but that you can see it has that same um, curving pattern with the visual effect of paint, you know, streaming down mm -hmm. the surface uh, of a canvas or a board. Um, and David asked a question um, asking um, Erica, how much time does it take to actually create some of these pieces? And, like for this one that we're looking at now. So 
So um, the, the more colors that are in it, you can almost guarantee the more time it's gonna take. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, these color splash ones take a lot more time because there's a lot more focus and attention put on to creating that, that gradient um, and getting it placed in the right place because that top portion, that's not that fringy pile weave that I usually do, right? That kind of goes back towards that pictorial mm -hmm. tapestry techniques. Right. Um, so that, that takes a lot more time. Um, it's tough to say, I mean, I, that's really tough to say. I want to say, I'm not sure how to answer that question. <laughs> what lots about these? Lots and lots of days. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Lots and lots of. What about these newest works, the large scale works you're working on? I mean, you were probably consumed with them during the quarantine, but yes. how long did these take? So, um, quarantine itself, I actually was home from work during that time. That yes. During like, the real, like the, the main por portion of the shutdown. Um, and I want to say, I probably from beginning to end probably spent only about like two weeks. I was actually really oh, wow. surprised. I'm not used to doing that. I usually have work and like other stuff. You're juggling on. other things, yeah. So like being able to just like actually spend like a real full day in the studio like all the time, mm -hmm. I was able to go through the process a lot quicker. Yeah. Um, so that one took about two weeks. And then this one, because it's double-sided, yeah. you, I mean, you see the scale, but in actuality of like woven process, it's really like twice as much as that mm. because it's like two sides put together. That's right, yeah. Um, so that one took, um, I think, that one was probably close to a month, um, but I have been back at work part time, mm -hmm. so I've been splitting my time and I started grad school. So there was like not as much focused energy able to be given to it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it was beast. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I can say like the little guys. Yes. Um, the minis. The my minis. Those um, I can if I like sit down and just do them. They just take me a few hours. Oh wow. Because um, those ones I have them, they're just like three colors. They're mm -hmm. not the right like upwards of forty colors that I've put into some weavings. Um, so it's it's a lot quicker to do those sections. And there are sixteen of these displayed here in the exhibition. Now, some of you may have been listening to Erica's artist talk, but um. I just wanted to come back to a point that we discussed, so I'm sorry if it's repetitive for some people, but um, her interest in using the architecture of the space, which you can see in two of these um, works we have installed here. And um, what what are your some of your plans for future works that you create and how to use architectural space in those? Okay. Um, I think I currently have kind of like two thought processes here, um, one of which is just you know, keeping my eye out for unique locations that have funky edges and corners and um, different architectural elements that I can play into. Um, and then another thought that I just like just recently had actually when I was working on the color block piece over there with the, the funky edges um, is kind of a way of maybe creating a little bit of my own architecture off of the mm -hmm. flat wall um, and creating a structure that maybe has like some free flowing curves or angles to it and then putting the weaving up against that so that even though it may end up displayed on a flat wall, it has real depth, not just through color play, but through actual use of space. Right. Um, and being able to make it a little bit more sculptural than just being on a flat wall. So I think those are probably the two like architecturally heavy ideas that I have. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I think that would be um, a really fascinating, you know, progression of your work because I, I, you know, individually I see your work as being very sculptural in itself and these two works where you're looking at the space and that it's sitting in only increases that. But I find, you know, this color blocking piece very sculptural and part of that fact, as I mentioned before, is because of the way you use color and that these 
these color blocks almost seem like protrusions to me, like the, from a distance, you know, there is depth and different, um, different layers within this um, piece. And so the idea of making or creating different forms for these pieces to kind of sit upon to take their mm -hmm. own shape would be really interesting. So can you talk a little bit um, about your inspiration? I know you've discussed color and texture being an inspiration, but do you, like before you start a project, um, do you draw inspiration from something you've seen and ar architecture itself, an image? What really spurs an idea on for you to pursue on the loom? I'm gonna say probably like two of those things you kind of mentioned are two like heavy things. In terms of like the architectural pieces, location really does help a lot. Yeah. Um, like what really got me when I first had that thought, there was this really funky, like not even 90 degree angle corner outside of the weaving studio in Clifftown University. And so because of that, I was able to form that color specifically where it was at that little divot, mm -hmm. which you can see in the poster. There's like the lights on the flat wall and then the real saturated colors on that. Just like with indigo corner, like you said, that it's, it's right in that corner. So that one was designed for just like a normal 90 degree yep. corner. Um, quarantine, I had, I knew I was going to have this space, so I kind of went yeah. a little differently and created the, the depth, like the lengths myself. Um, but how that cascades over the corner around the outside mm -hmm. and it gets really long in that inside corner again. Mm -hmm. um, that really inspires form for me is the location that I envision those to be with the architecture. Right. Um, colors. I have always, I don't want to say always, but I think this is going to be a little surprising. So when I first got into art school, Mm -hmm. I was not a color person. <laughs> I used to just be like graphite sketch drawing. Oh person. wow! Yeah. So, like, when I got into school, it was like, okay, it's going to be very neutral. Maybe a pop of color here and there. Like that was all that I wanted to do. And then my second class, I was like, all right, like this weaving thing, you can really play with color more than this. Like maybe I should push myself. So I made myself do like a semester of just like super saturated color, um, and I use Chipotle glass work as yes. like, my inspiration for color, and that's oh, great. What kind of pushed me into like super saturated color, and I just like never stopped. Mm. Um, so I started using color then, and then the gradients came about, I don't really know why gradients really started. I did like a color sample weave where I did all the colors, and then I duplicated it in the weft to create like blocks of color and to see where they would inter and inter how they would interact. Um, and I think that's kind of where I started with this whole idea of just gradients yeah. instead of pulling from me from a place, mm -hmm. which is where I think color originated for me. Okay. Now thinking of color and looking at some of these forms, are is is nature ever in your mind like natural uh, I, I view these as being really, when I see them, it reminds me of something I've seen in nature, whether it's moss or, or you know, like lichen or like this one over here reminds me of like bark. Uh, and I know you have one named porcupine that's not in this installation, but do natural forms come into play when you're planning a, a weaving? So I've never planned it around that, um, but you mentioned that during installation as well. and. Um, I want to say that subconsciously, probably very heavy mood driven. I love nature. I love hiking. Mm -hmm. I travel to do hiking and getting out there. And I'm always taking pictures of like fungus and moss and bark right. and things like that. So I think subconsciously, it's probably greatly influenced it. Because mm -hmm. as soon as you said that, I was like, yeah, that's everywhere. <laughs> like, I right. <laughs> didn't realize it on my own. Um, but yeah, I think nature probably has played a huge part. And as I'm kind of making the shift to trying to be a little bit more intentional with my inspiration and my context. I think that that's something I'm going to lean into a little bit and see if I can make it more apparent and more yeah. influenced from stuff like that. Yeah, and I think it partly maybe is because of, of the material that the that fibers are inherently 
you know, from the natural world. So you see fibers that are, you know, more stringy or more fluffy, and it re reminds you of maybe, you know, the place they came from, but yeah. also the, the natural environment itself. Yeah. So we mentioned, uh, we talked a little bit um, in the artist talk, and I mentioned briefly just how I see gravity being kind of a medium in your work, um, that it's always present. I mean, you don't, you don't see any works in this gallery where you, ha you have fibers that aren't kind of draping down. Um, so if you could talk about how gravity is kind of part of your decision process and how, how you, you, you might not even think about it while you're making, but how that has an effect on your style itself. While I'm making is actually maybe I'll show you guys a little behind the scenes. Yes. I'll show you a back or part of the back. So the actual woven part is generally very short compared to the act, the end piece. Mm. Um, so while I am making, I have to consider that length mm -hmm. and the effect of that 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 pool is going to have. So interestingly enough, like. Even though you don't see that from the front, I can kind of look at these and tell you which ones have a longer mm. actual woven portion compared to other ones. So the longer you make that beginning, the more pull cool it's going to look like it has. Ah. So like if you look at this piece, to me, at least for me looking at it, like these, these look like they're really cool. Like, well, they only start like up here. So they have like a longer fall. Mm -hmm. um, so I do kind of consider that, like how, how much of a drip do I really want it to kind of look? And then I can play into that by creating those layers that make it look even longer on top of that. Yes. Um, but that part of how it's going to hang is, is always on my mind when I go into making the piece. Right. That's really interesting because as, as you have discussed weaving in the process and maybe a traditional or conventional understanding of a tapestry or weaving or wall hanging, you think of verticals and horizontals being quite evenly or equally represented yes. in a work and that you can't really, you don't look at a tapestry and think, oh, that looks very vertical or horizontal. Yeah. And I see your works being um, very vertical, but um, as you were talking about uh, behind the scenes, it's still that same, you know. It still has that underlying structure. structure yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And those, thank you so much for everyone who's watching live. If you have any questions as we're going through, please feel free to um, type them in here. Now, some of the works, um, I'll just give a couple close ups where you're using actually pattern fabric as well. Still within, you know, kind of imperceptible as you're from a distance, um, they just look like the actual colors, solid colors. But as you get up close, you see um, patterning and um, it's difficult to see, but you can see her use of a tool here. So transparent materials within the weaving, which I think adds to kind of the depth and sculpt sculptural um, quality as well. You can see tool in this work, which I, sorry, is difficult to see on this camera. Um, and I'll show you some of my, speaking of like pattern boutiques are like some of my favorite pa uh, fabrics to incorporate, um, like over here. You oh, can yeah. get like these really beautiful saturated colors and because it's dyed, it's the same on the front and back. Right. So right. it like plays really well into these drapey hits like another one. And it yes. just really can, it can often enhance that gradation because it incorporates those colors together. Right, yeah. In a way That's that a like point. a solid obviously can't. Now she um, had talked about in the artist lecture with, um, I had asked her a question about the use of kind of unconventional materials with her newspaper in um, fake news. And she's also using um, translucent newspaper bags, these orange newspaper bags. Um, and if there were any other materials, unconventional materials that she would like to work with in the future, if you want to talk about that a little bit. Um, I'll just mention, I liked it. I said there's like this one weird, I don't even know what it's called. I just like stumbled upon it in the store. But it looks like, like an industrial trash bag. So it's like kind of clear, kind of cloudy, but it's like stretchy. That's like a weird thing that I really want to play with. And ever since I've seen it, it's been in the back of my mind. Um, but I think really like moving forward, I'm actually kind of trying to go a little bit more 
more conventional maybe and okay. material. Yeah. Um, and finding things that I can source more intentionally and know more about what the content is. Um, I've, I've been collecting material for as long as I can remember and I have so much stuff that it's like I have no idea what it is at this point. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think I'm actually going to try to get through that material so that I can have a better that are handled on like, what it is that I'm using and what I'm making these out of. Yes, yeah. That makes sense as well. So we have a lot of comments saying how beautiful these works are and how much detail is in them. And there is so much detail in these works that is really hard to capture in a camera or like in a photograph in the publication. So I really encourage all of you, if it's if you're able to come into the gallery to see these in person because they really... Um, encourage close looking. It's, I mean, you could look at one of these pieces for a very long time to get a sense of the, the texture and the detail and have, try and even count how many materials that she's incorporating together. So if it's possible to come in and see these, we really encourage you to do that. The gallery is open. It's normal hours, um, Tuesday through Friday and Sunday. Um, and we would love to see you. And as David mentioned before, there'll be a little um, brochure publication um, available in the galleries about um, Erica's work as well. You'll notice that she does have a, in a number of these pieces, you have a kind of a subtle use of metallics or iridescent materials. Try to incorporate something a little bit shiny in everything. <laughs> Just a little something. Which this one you get is, um, you know, it's using neutrals and browns and dark browns, but from a distance, um, you can really see these metallic pieces stand out that really draws you into it. Um, which hard to convey over the camera again, but you'll notice it when you're in the gallery. It catches your Definitely, yeah, and on this one as well. So there are, um, you know, the, the fiber arts movement really kind of emerged in the 1960s and 70s with artists, textile artists and fiber artists um, being finally being discussed in the same conversations as contemporary art rather than traditional crafts. And a lot of that was based on their kind of uh, their move to abstraction and fiber artists were known for uh, using large scale and materials that weren't necessarily um, associated with traditional textile movement. So Erica's work aligns with that history of, of fiber arts um, and fiber arts being, you know, in the conversation of contemporary art. And that's one of the reasons we're so excited to have you on view. But as you can see from her form and compositional choices, they're really her own perspective and unique in that way. So it's really pushing um, the contemporary fiber arts movement. Um, uh, but it's, it's from that um, context, which is such an important part of art history and the Friedman has a work by um, Neda Al-Halali who is a who's a well-respected internationally renowned fiber artist that really emerged during the 60s and 70s it's a large-scale work using coiling and weaving and coiling and braiding and wrapping um, it's really a beautiful piece. yeah that's yeah. that's using color in an interesting way mm -hmm. so to have these viewed kind of in the same um, context or in relationship to one another um, is really special for the Friedman that has that um, history of collecting that work as well. So we are running up close to the six o'clock mark, which um, is when we are gonna conclude this virtual tour. But as I go around and give a couple more close inspections of some of the work of art, if you have any questions for Erica, please um, put those on Facebook and I'll be sure to ask her. We're so delighted 
Um, we were very lucky that she was able to be here um, and ask her questions. So it was kind of an artist interview with the virtual tour. But it adds, adds so much important context to get an understanding about how she works and what you think about compositionally. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you guys for having me. And the questions have honestly helped me so much just to think through things at a level that I haven't fully thought through. And having that kind of discussion is super, super helpful as an artist too, to kind of like hone in and focus on things as I move forward. Exactly. Yeah, we can't wait to see where your new projects take you after seeing what you've done in just a few months with these two quarantine and fake news pieces. Yeah, this one is, is really fantastic. Yeah, there's to, despite the difference in scale between these minis and some of the large scales work, there's not any less of a textural <laughs> or interest or intricacy. I know that, um, like you said, it may take you a, a shorter time to make, but the interest level compositionally and texturally, um, which engages, you know, our tactile visual senses isn't, isn't any less. So these are really fantastic. And to see them all together as a, as a collection yeah. is really great. Yeah, they're a great way for me to just kind of play with color and pull things together quickly. Um, maybe something that I don't maybe think would work on a large scale or just don't have time to really delve into on a larger scale. So they're like really fun for me on that level. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're also great. Like it, I have them kind of scattered around my house, like in little awkward spots where like you can't fit like a huge, a huge thing. Mm -hmm. They're like really great to just kind of like fill in little, little nooks and crannies and have something, some, a little pop, pop of color. That's right. Yeah. And um, as David is saying in the comments too, as a reminder, um, almost all of these works in the galleries are currently for sale too. So they're available for purchase for anyone who is um, interested. And talking about um, patterned, I noticed this the other day, this one that has got quite a lot of patterned um, textiles, even though it's a, you know, like a color swatch almost, a color mm -hmm. sample, she calls it. Um, but you can see that there are the different pattern, which just adds to the sculptural quality and visual interest as well. So I want to just do a one more once over and then thank you all so much. Um, we'll start here at the entrance for anyone who didn't see kind of the full show from the beginning.
Then we're back to the collection of minis, which is a really spectacular installation here to conclude the exhibition. So I wanna thank you all so much again for tuning in to the Facebook Live um, and thank Erica here. <laughs> Yes, and thank you so much for being here and for being, uh, having your presentation and virtual tour. Um, like I said, I hope to see you all in the gallery soon um, and for our next um, virtual programming, which will happen in two weeks. So thank you so much and enjoy your evenings.